Hello. Good evening. Hello, hello. Are there, before we get started, are there any empty seats? Is anybody sitting next to an empty seat? Okay, I'm sorry for everybody that's standing. We tried there for a minute. Um, hello, good evening, welcome. My name is Dina Hagag. I am a curatorial practice MFA alumni with the inaugural class in 2013. Um, thanks. It's a really good program. Um, how many curatorial practice students are here, or alum? Yeah, that's right. Northwest, east, south, everywhere. Um, so yeah, after graduation, I had the great honor of directing the contemporary, which we'll talk about a lot today. Um, and then today, currently, I am the president and CEO of United States Artists, which is an artist funding organization based in Chicago. Um, I started there a couple of months ago and very sadly vacated my post, but I'm very happy to be back in Baltimore tonight here to honor two very, very incredible men. Um, George and Fred have had a tremendous effect on my life, both directly and indirectly in every way imaginable. Um, so much of the foundation of my career has, built, has been built on sort of the ethos of both of these folks. When I was thinking about how to introduce their talk, I kept coming back to this one particular memory. How many people here know George Sissel? Raise your hands, like know him. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so, um, so we, we joke a lot in curatorial practice that um, George is very like sphinx-like. He's like a cat. He's kind of like Yoda. Um, he doesn't scare very easy. He doesn't, he's not too animated. He's incredibly calm. And it's very much to your benefit as a graduate student, but oftentimes it's also to your detriment because you're just like scared shitless the entire time about what he's really thinking. So I graduated and um, the fall after graduation, I went back to visit and um, I walked in the door and to the left, there was an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper that just said, I, I printed a copy for reference. Um, Why aren't you panicking yet? George Sichel, September 5th, 2013 at 5 p.m. And I was so curious as to like what compelled, first of all, George to say this thing that seemed so out of character. And then also that they had hung it. And ever since I've had a copy in my house that hangs, why aren't you panicking yet? And we learned that that class, is there anybody here from the 2014 class? Oh, one person, I can't see you, I'm very sorry about this story. So that class <laughs> hadn't finished their um, practicum in what George thought was a timely fashion and walked in casually and in his same sort of Yoda-like way just went, why aren't you panicking yet? And like left, just left them there to sort of like <laughs> stew. And it has resonated with a lot of us ever since. And the reason I'm bringing it up today is that it sort of dawned on me that that statement, like, why aren't you panicking yet, is so much of George's practice, right? Which is that throughout his life, so many of the projects he's worked on has kind of reminded the world that there's so much we're not seeing. And while why aren't you panicking yet is a really dramatic way of saying, why aren't you pay att paying attention? Why aren't you doing this thing? Why are you not prioritizing this incredibly important moment or topic? which leads me to talk a little bit about mining the museum and the um, absolutely unequivocal weight that that exhibition had. And I think in 1992, to invite Fred to work on a project at the Maryland Historical Society was another moment of asking our public why we weren't panicking yet about issues of race and class, of equity and inclusion. And it blows my mind that it's 2017 and it still feels like perhaps we are not panicking enough. So it is great to have them back um, and before I get into their introductions, I want to say two really, two, three really quick housekeeping things. Bathrooms are outside in a hallway to your right. As soon as you exit to the left, we are selling Mining the Museum catalogs. There will be first editions that are sold for $250. On eBay, you can get them for like $400, so we think $250 is a steal. Um, and then there are second editions that are $60 and have all been very graciously signed by Fred. The other thing is that there will be a reception immediately after the talk right outside in the main gallery, so please join us. And a big thank you to The Contemporary, which I no longer run, so it's my first time actually thanking, thank you to The Contemporary, um, to Micah's Mixed Media Series, Critical Studies MA, Art History, Graduate Studies, and Curatorial Practice, and the Offices of Communications and Community Engagement for sponsoring this talk. Thank you very much. And with that, <laughs> thank you. We can introduce our guests of honor. George Sissel has mounted groundbreaking exhibitions created community arts programs and taught courses in the fine arts and humanities for close to 50 years. For nearly his entire life, George has built a practice that concentrates particularly on developing new models for connecting art, artists, and audiences. 
1985, he opened the George Sissel Gallery, where he promoted the careers of young and emerging artists. In advance of that, George trained as a sculptor, studying with artist Isamu Noguchi. Teaching at Cardinal Gibbons High School, he developed an interdisciplinary arts and humanities pilot program. And for 10 years, he taught in the Baltimore County Schools for Emotionally Disadvantaged Children, which combined classroom study with real-world work experience. In 1989, he founded the Contemporary, a nomadic, non-collecting art museum here, who was also sponsoring this talk, clearly. He directed the museum until joining MICA in 1997, where he has served as the curator in residence, introduced and taught the Exhibition Development Seminar and Curatorial Studies Concentration, and in 2011, he founded the MFA in Curatorial Practice, which he directed until 2016. His many accolades include the Distinguished Arts Administrator Award, Governor Citation, and the Mayor's and Presidential Citations for the City of Baltimore. George is also retiring this year. Very sadly, I know. Um, Fred Wilson, who uh, is amazing, was born in 1954 in the Bronx, which is also amazing. Uh, he has created site-specific installations in collaboration with museums and cultural institutions throughout North America, the Caribbean, Europe, and the Middle East and Asia. His work encourages viewers to reconsider social and historical narratives and raises critical questions about the politics of erasure and exclusion. Beginning with the groundbreaking and critically acclaimed exhibition Mining the Museum at the Maryland Historical Society, which we will talk about at length today and is turning 25, Fred has juxtaposed and recontextualized existing objects to create new installations which alter their traditional meanings or interpretations. In 2003, Fred represented the United States at the 50th Venice Biennale with the solo exhibition Fred Wilson, Speak of Me As I Am. His many accolades include the prestigious John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant in 1999, amongst many, many other things. Thank you very much. Join me in welcoming Fred and George. were the same. They were old paintings and marble busts and silver teapots, but somehow <laughs> everything looked different. Nothing was as I expected, and yet everything made sense. Why? I know this dream means something, but it's going to take me a long time to figure it all out. The museum should be a place where anything can happen. An exhibition is an experience where you should expect the unexpected. It should make you think. It should make you feel something for the person who made the objects you are looking at. Art is like an exhibition. It makes you question. It makes you wonder. It opens you up to new emotions and the discovery of new ways to experience the world around you. Art is like history. The more you experience it, the more you learn about yourself. <laughs> Installation art is a way some contemporary artists work to create an environment all around us which actively stimulates our senses and gets us to reflect on our experience of looking in an unexpected way. In installation art, there are no limits to the kinds of materials an artist can use. Paint, wood, photographs, video, sound, light, ordinary objects we use every day. Hi, I'm Fred Wilson, and I'm an artist. The artworks and historical objects on the third floor are the materials I chose and arranged to create the installations mining the museum. Mining the museum represents my own personal vision of the Maryland Historical Society. But mining the museum is not only on the third floor. As I mine the museum's collections, I left messages for you in other places around the museum. Oh, 
I have not seen that since then. <laughs> we, we mined it oh, very wow. recently for you. Wow. So yeah, this was a surprise for, for Fred to see this. Uh, this was the video that was playing in the lobby of uh, the Historical Society, so before you went in um, to his show on the, on the third floor. So, yeah. I was <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen that since then. I didn't, you know, one of those things. Well, anyway, there it was. I, uh, I decided to do that video after having worked on the exhibition quite a bit and um, wanted to have a, some kind of a mediating device for the, the, uh, the visitors coming into the museum because everyone goes to a historical site. If you go to a historical site, you're going to expect the expected. And, um, and it's kind of like ancestor worship, or it used to be. And, um, and I wanted to, uh, first of all, make people know that this was me and not the institution doing this. See what I look like as well. Uh, because generally people are, when they go into a museum, they, they think that, you know, the gods on high decide these things. And, and they used to. And they used to, yeah. Or well, they consider themselves that. Anyway, and so I, um, but I also wanted them to, to sort of go through it in a different modality, you know, kind of uh, in sort of this dreamlike modality that I sort of created that it was really like uh, what used to be the Twilight Zone TV show where they control the, I control everything. Uh, and uh, so, so that they, <clears throat> so that perhaps even if they didn't get all that, that they they realized that the historical side something unusual was happening, and so that by the time they got to the third floor, you know, they weren't completely flummoxed. I mean, of course they were, but uh, by the, there was something different going on. I'd like to find out. Can you hear me? All right. Um, how many people here actually saw mining the museum? How many people didn't see it, but had studied it and read about it somewhere? Okay. How many people that this will be their first introduction to it? Great. So I, I say that because um, we didn't want to assume any of those things in terms of your relationship to the show or to Fred's work um, in our conversation. And so we really, I really felt that we needed to sort of give you first the backstory um, before really talking about the exhibition, both for people that were there, were not there, or this is completely new to. So, five years ago, on the 20th anniversary of Mining the Museum, uh, the American Association of Museums conference was in Baltimore uh, for the th third time uh, since Mining the Museum. And we were asked to give a presentation about the history of the project. And I was asked to sort of give the backstory, and the audience was all museum people, right? So people from historical societies, from art museums, botanical gardens, zoos. That was our, our, our audience that we were talking to. And generally not curators. And generally not curators, thank you. Yeah. I would say mostly um, uh, education. Education, registrars, museum directors, conser conservation. Exactly. Um, so I wanted to read you the, the sort of statement of the backstory first for everyone. Um, and keep in mind, this is five years ago to that audience. Right? I was asked to tell the backstory of Mining the Museum. As the founding director of the Contemporary, the institution that conceived of the project and invited Fred to Baltimore, I would like us to look back at how all this began. To do that, as I say to my grad students in curatorial practice at MICA, you have to historically think about what was going on in the field. Because in 1989, when the contemporary was founded, the museum world certainly did not look like it does today. Nor were they discussing issues of audience, community, or engagement. Museums very much were very much a closed, members-only society for people with certain incomes, class, or education. We were at the peak of the culture wars, when museums had to start thinking, begin thinking about their audience and who they were trying to reach. It's very interesting to think back to AAM in 1990, two years before mining the museum. Lisa Corrin and I attended the conference in Chicago 
when, unlike today, there were no sessions about artists working in museums or engaging communities outside of their membership. It was very much an internal discussion, unlike today. The Contemporary is founded on the principle of connecting art and artists to a wider audience. Our early mission was to expand and redefine museum, exhibition, collection, and education practices. We became a nomadic museum. We were called the Unmuseum by the New York Times, the Hermit Crab Museum. Taking our ectoskeleton to different communities, working with artists into unlikely temporary, non-contemporary art spaces. We created collaborations that cross disciplines, including visual, visual aids with the healthcare community, photo manifesto with, refugee, with Russian refugees, and soul shadows, urban warrior myths with victims of gun violence and the Baltimore City Police Department. After completing these three projects for their, our first two years, roaming around the city, working with different artists and communities, we started to evaluate what we were doing and saw there was an impact. This impact certainly was in communities where the artists were working, but no one was understanding our mission about questioning museum practice. So we took a step back and decided to choose our next project with an artist whose very practice was questioning museological issues. The timing couldn't have been better. Lisa and I attended a lecture by Fred at the Hirshhorn. We knew Fred's work from the WPA's The Other Museum and Primitism High and Low at Metro Pictures Gallery, where he used faux objects to create environments that looked like museums. We invited him to visit Baltimore to see many of our cultural institutions. By the end of the day, he requested the Maryland Historical Society. Why? Because Fred's story, when he went inside, was invisible, hidden away. He wanted to see if he could reveal it to the public. Ironically, the year before, we were planning photo manifesto for the vacant Greyhound bus terminal a block behind Maryland Historical Society. We had a very practical reason to meet with the director, Charles Lyle. Why? We needed their bathrooms for our volunteers. After we sought his permission, Charles wanted to know who we were and what we were doing. We literally looked out the back window of his office, pointing to the holes in the roof of the Greyhound, and explained our mission to him and what we were trying to do. As we were leaving, he said to us in the lobby, as we, as we passed their 18th century high boys, I really am envious of what you're doing. I wish I could figure out a way to connect these high boys to the children that live in the projects three blocks from here. A year later, Lisa and I took up that challenge, which eventually gave us entree into the Maryland Historical Society with Fred. It began with a six-month courtship between institutions, staffs at all levels, facilities, guards, directors, curators, historians, librarians, and both boards, all people Fred would need to work with during his year-long residency. The Contemporary created a contract that not just talked about the relationship between the museums and their singular and joint responsibilities, but most importantly, how to protect Fred's rights as a contemporary artist with creative freedoms. Remember, the culture wars were still being fought, and the Maryland Historical Society had never worked with a contemporary artist before and could not foresee controversies that often come and appear with artists. The possibilities were laid out and talked about with Fred. He agreed to all the parameters and restrictions, including that no objects could be brought in from the outside of the museum, that they had to be in the collection, all text and labels had to be approved and historically accurate. He could not lie about an object as he, ha as he had perhaps done before. His residency at the Maryland Historic Society was mainly doing research with their and the contemporaries' interns. 
He also involved many local artists who worked on the project and were also trained as docents. Mining the Museum included the larger Baltimore community working with schools and involving numerous community members. So that's, that's just to give you, before the show even happened, uh, what was involved just in the process institutionally. And Fred knows a lot of that. Some of it he's learning for the first time. Yes, exactly. I, I guess I didn't read that contract too closely. <laughs> um, so Fred, I'd like, I'd like if you would, for us to maybe begin, uh, I mentioned um, ab about you working with faux objects and creating a museum environment. Could you maybe talk about a little bit about your practice and your artwork like prior to mining the museum, I guess, and with that, a lot of people talked about mining the museum as you as a, as a curator, and, and I, and I, which obviously you had worked previously as, but how you perhaps distinguish, if you don't distinguish between a curator and an artistic practice also. I, um, uh, I have been interested in museums for a very long time. Is, is this on? Can you, okay. Uh, for a very, very long time. You know, from my childhood, taking classes at the Met. I'm a New Yorker, so I took classes at the Met. And I really think being in the Met uh, at a young age, uh, taking classes, made me very comfortable in museums because we were in the galleries, we went behind the scenes. And in fact, um, sometimes you'd be in the basement, you'd see a statuary covered with just, you know, a piece of plastic, at least back then it was like that. And so I think I got my mind thinking about that. Objects live in very different environments, can live in very different environments. They, they, they have different meanings because you, normally you see them in the museum and they're all perfectly arranged and behind the scenes they're not so like that so much. And so I just, uh, on, on some level, I think I got it uh, as a kid and then I started working in museums. I actually, I was a guard in my college museum so it was also another way to get, it was all about being comfortable in the museum so it was in the back of my head. But I mostly, uh, this really s started when I sort of came to New York after college and um, began, since I just came out of art school, very highly visually uh, kind of uh, uh, attuned uh, and had worked in museums. So I had an, an out, you know, also an insider's perspective, not only an artist, but also an insider perspective. And then looking at the museums, through those eyes, particularly working at the Metropolitan as I did in, in as a freelance educator and the American Museum of Natural History as a freelance educator uh, and going across the park some days um, to do, to teach. Uh, and of course, those museums are quite different, but sometimes house the same kinds of collections and speak about them very differently and people react to them very differently. And this really intrigued me um, and I also, felt that neither museum was really speaking to me. There was a whole other public that they were talking to as if I, was, you know, I wasn't there. I didn't have any uh, connection to some of these things on view if you look at some of the various uh, uh, objects on display in both those museums like the African collection or the native collections and things. So, so this really, this was got me thinking and sir, at that time in the, uh, oh, when was it, the late 70s, early 80s, uh, there was a lot of anthropology coming out, writing uh, about uh, that. The, the whole field of anthropology was being very self-reflective and and thinking and thinking about their their position within their own discipline and how were they kind of displaying and kind of making meaning for other people. And so that I really because the art world was sort of completely blind to it, basically because in New York City, it's all about you know. Uh, the value of things uh, more than anything else. And, and, and that controls how things come and go uh, and where they exist in, 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 this, in public fear, seer, sphere. Um, and so this was all rolling around in my head. And I, so rather than, I did make very large outdoor sculpture originally, but I really, and I, that I wanted people to interact with in the public, in public, arenas, of course, in New York City as a young artist, you know, you don't have that many opportunities. And if you do, certainly back then, uh, the city would, would deal with, it deals with the art is like it deals with everything, kind of, you know, it gets knocked around. Uh, and so um, 
when I, uh, since I really was interested in galleries, and when I started working in a ga gallery, and and uh, and eventually got my own gallery to work with, um, I started experimenting with these ideas that I had about culture, about objects, and created faux installations in this uh, uh, museum, my little gallery space in the South Bronx, uh, with with other artists' works, and then I began to make works. Uh, collecting objects and creating faux spaces in, in commercial galleries uh, and nonprofit galleries uh, to speak, to sort of ask these questions that I had in my head and just basically see if there was any, um, you know, if there was any there there uh, by asking, sometimes having the objects ask the questions. Uh, and, and I could do that because I, you know, I bought these things, you know, uh, and could, uh, but you know, put them in a space that really looked like a museum space. Uh, so that was kind of the genesis of that, because I, I began to feel, cause, because I did make things uh, early on, but mostly I was taking pictures, you know, uh, photographing things that I saw and uh, uh, arranging things in my studio. Um, and so I just basically thought that you know, after doing a, a particular project uh, at the gallery that I ran, which had three different rooms, the African, uh, the uh, Anthropology Museum, the Art Museum, and the, the Historic House space, uh, and by all contemporary artists, and uh, you really didn't, couldn't tell. People thought they were from these, uh, from these uh, the particular disciplines uh, in these spaces, and it was, you know, didn't look like it uh, to me, but actually for pe people really thought that the objects in the in the in the anthropological space were, you know, from made by people that they, you know, from someplace else far away, and they were made by the same artists who made things in the contemporary gallery, and but no nobody made the connection. And the same with the historic space, nobody made the connection that these were all the same artists, and they weren't making anything special for the show. They were just making their own work, and so the space is really uh, changed the way the viewers thought about the objects. And, uh, and thought about the artworks. Uh, one, it seemed like nobody could ever know the person. They were from far away, and most of them were from New York City. And of course, if you were a person of color back at that time, people were responding directly to their heritage uh, and making objects that really felt like they were from these environments, uh, Jimmy Durham and um, oh, just a number of people. Um, and, uh, and then in the historic space, you know, I made it look, you know, I put some roped off chairs to make it really feel like a historic space, but bas basically the artworks there also, um, um, people thought they had a certain kind of uh, authority because they were, they, the, the way the space was arranged with them. And, and in the, the regular gallery space, it just seemed like there were, everything was scientifically arranged and it was just because, it was the, because of the whiteness of the space. And um, so this really was a watershed event for me and I, I thought, well, if, if, the, if the environment is really shifting the meaning of what this art, art is and what, who the artist is, I want to be on that side of things. Uh, you, know, if I'm, you know, if it's going to be shifted, I'm going to do the shifting of my own work. Uh, and so that was the beginning, beginning of it. I never thought a, a real museum would ever invite me to do anything like that. Um, but um, so when, when they came a knocking, it was, uh, it was you know, not a problem to say yes. It was interesting, I mean, because we were called the Unmuseum and we were questioning museum, what a museum was. And so you say when a museum came knocking, it was, uh, it was us, right. the contemporary. Well, what would I know? What did I know? Right, what did you know? What did a lot of people know? Uh, but it's interesting in terms of you talking about these spaces in terms of history and art, right? Because when, you, when we brought you to Baltimore for the, for the day, and you visited, you, we took you to, well, we didn't take you, we dropped you off everywhere and waited for you in the car, of course, we, different we didn't want people to associate us with you. You wanted the experience to be yours. And so you went to the Walters, you went to the BMA, uh, you went to the Van Peel Museum, you, you went to, I think it was seven or eight places in Baltimore that day for an hour each. First time ever going to any of them. And first time ever. And so, you, so what caused you to, you already talked about what caused you to work with the contemporary, what caused you in terms of Maryland Historic Society and Baltimore. Because I was really dealing with African history at that point. All my projects were sort of annoyed about the colonial period and what it did to art, what it did to, not what it did to art, but what, 
how art was uh, involved with that, and also how the, the record in these museums is washed away of how these things came to the collections. And so that was what I was all about. I had studied in West Africa, so it was kind of one of those things I had you know, in my head. But uh, looking at all the museums in, in, in Maryland was quite fascinating, but when I came, went into the historical society, I had a kind of a visceral response. You know, I, I was uncomfortable there. And what, it surprised me because, you know, I live in New York, I've been to the Met, I've seen places like this, uh, museums with historic uh, American objects before, but I just, I just felt uncomfortable. And, and for me as an artist, trying to stay attuned to my responses, not only intellectual but physical, I just thought, well, if I'm having a, you know, this, this visceral response to this space and not really understanding why, this is where... I want to investigate. You know, all, it's all investigations. It's all trying to understand my own responses to things as well, and um, and so I, I thought, well, this would be the place to do it. I really did not know I wanted to reveal anything. I not at all, and it took me a long time to to kind of uh, and the, the, the place, the people, the objects told me where to go with this thing. Um, it seems like a no-brainer now, you know. Uh, but in in the beginning, I I did not know, and this is how my practice is now. When I go to museums, I don't have a preconceived notion of what I'm going to do. I just sort of I'm sort of tabula rasa as best I can, and and just be a sponge to everything that happens to me and everyone who talks to me and everything I see. Because generally, I'm not from the places, the cities uh, uh, that I'm making these works in. So I try to absorb it all, and again make it not for a few curators in New York, uh, it's who will never see it, uh, make it for wherever it is I am. So could you, you touched on in terms of the, uh, the creative process, um, in terms of coming up with, with mining the museum, the actual installation, could you maybe talk about how your res, how that, what the creative process was during your residency that resulted in mining the museum? Uh, well, the great thing was that I did it over a year's time, and I rarely get that opportunity to sort of just relax into it. And I was coming and go from New York, so it was a, not a far trip. But, you know, I have to say, uh, you and Lisa were great, were, were kind of really catalysts for that, my practice. I have to say, I didn't come in knowing what I was going to do. Uh, I knew that I would look at everything and talk to all the... The, the people on staff to understand what their role was and what their job was and what their, and their perspective on their collections. I'm always, I always talk to everyone who has a great deal of knowledge of the collections, and so it becomes a dialogue, and uh, that was the beginning of that part of the process. However, uh, because they work in communities, and Mike and I only worked, was working in a museum, and as an artist, usually you're in your studio, and you don't really, you're not, necessarily inclined to sort of go out into uh, uh, into cities and, and just talk to people and sort of bring them in and, and that sort of thing. I was not that kind of artist at all, at, or I, I didn't think I was initially. Um, and they forced me, to, <laughs> not physically, but uh, uh, because they were used to dealing with communities, uh, they wanted to make sure I, I met with as many people in the community as possible and they set up various meetings with groups, which I eventually grew into and realized how important it was and enjoyed, because I'm a very social person, but I'd never connected that with, with making art at all. I was very much in my own head, in my own studio. Um, but, and so I, I had to sort of get a certain comfort level with doing that with people who, like, you know, from a different city, in a, you know, like Rotary Clubs, or whatever it was that, you, the people that I was meeting, and I'm getting over thinking that I didn't have, what do we have in common? What am I, you know, how is this going to, to work? And basically all I did was talk to them about my work, my previous work, and, and you know, talk about who I am, and then got the conversations rolling. But so it really, and, and all that particularly, that, that kind of engagement is the, the biggest thing that I took from, from working with you and Lisa uh, and growing into it, and it's, obviously it's a major part of the projects that I do, because it's ultimately really important that the people who will actually see the exhibition and, and also the people in the museum have a kind of a, a buy-in, uh, tie-in, and, and they, they f especially for the museum people, they feel that uh, while they would never do what I do, they're, 
they're, they're assured that, or they feel that I have really respected them in their professions. A lot of museums, basically, the only thing they have wor worry about is that I'll make fun of them. I don't know, I don't get it. But, and, and of course, get over there, and I get over there, thoughts about what artists are. And I, I come in, besides the racial thing, besides you know, class or whatever, they, they, this whole artist thing, what is an artist? Even in art museums, uh, they, have issue, they have ideas in their head about what artists are. And if it's not even an art museum, it's a whole other crazy thing that I have all sorts of stories about uh, what people think about artists. And so I'm, I'm aware of all these things and I just let it sit. I, I, I let my preconceived notions with, with museum folks uh, sit or a city or a people or whatever, and just let them ride, and I and and so, till they eventually get to know me as a person, and get you know all their notions kind of have to deal with me as a person beyond those tropes. But Fred, I mean, you you describe very clearly in terms of how the people and the institutions affected you and your working your working process. But I wanted you to also talk about as an artist. That you you came up you, you weren't a guest curator you didn't come and look at objects and created a, a thematic exhibition um, you created a con a contemporary work of art a site specific work of art installation art um, how how did you in that year what was your process in terms of arriving at the final product so to speak uh, you know it, it, it's almost it, it, it's almost so simple I, I it's hard for me even just discuss because it's just so much, you know, I just looked at things and I talked to people. Really, that's all it was. And, and um, I had already been sort of putting the objects together in my studio and didn't think much of it, didn't think it was art. Uh, but I came to realize that the, uh, that the objects that I, I see, there, I just trust that there was something, if there's something that engaged me, made me think more, I, I trusted myself and just start to make lists and try to think about those, uh, those things. And, and things, some things would fall away and some things remained after, after you know, several months. And, um, and then uh, things, little things that people say it kind of always kind of inflect meaning onto an object that I perhaps didn't have or maybe it had something to do with where I was. And, and so that would also attach itself. And, and then looking at my own initial responses to things and then seeing if they still held water months later. But also seeing, seeing these objects in relationship to other things. Just once you start seeing a whole, certain things jump out and sort of have a dialogue. And, uh, and so that was also, that was the initial kind of uh, rolling around. But I, I, I really just, I write everything down because I would forget anyway, but I write it, all ideas down and uh, things that I see, things people say, and I usually end up with a book, and that was the first time I did that was with the Mining Museum, and uh, of, of ideas so that I wouldn't forget everything after a few days. And in, in, and in fact, some of the ideas uh, fall away because you, you, when you, you meet somebody new or, you, or you're in a new place, you have ideas that perhaps make no, you know, are simplistic, but you're new, so this is what jumps out at you. And uh, they, some of them fought, fell away. Uh, and there's other things that, that I, ideas I had, or thoughts that I had, uh, objects, that uh, they, st still had, they still had meaning. They still were very cogent uh, at the sort of, the, towards the end of the process of, of deciding what I'm doing. And, and so it seemed to me that it was beyond just a simplistic first, first view, and maybe the first view, because I was an outsider, you know, nobody else was sort of seeing. So, so I'm always looking for that, that kind of thing, and, and so it builds from that. So I don't have this trepidation that, you know, what am I gonna do, what am I gonna do? I just let it all, roll, you know, pour out and, and look at what I've, what, I've, what I've poured out. Now, after years of doing this, I'm a little more aware of things that I think will still remain in the final analysis, but but still, it's the same, you know, they all have to sort of uh, kind of make sense together. Um, and it was a, quite a while, eventually, it's, if you have this long period of, period of time, I began to realize what kind of things I was looking for. I mean, it became clear to everybody as I started pulling things out. 
uh, and then the curators would start pulling things out for me sometimes. It was just even more horrific than I want, wanted to deal with. And I said, no, thank you, no, that's, that's okay, put that back. Um, but, but yeah, everybody kind of got into the act uh, as, I, as the things I was pulling out became more and more uh, specific. Um, and um, so that's, that's basically how it, how it goes. And I think French people can see that, even if oh. they didn't see, uh, oh, yeah. in terms of the mind of the museum, that these pairings and juxtapositions and these sort of tableaus that you created, how they came about in terms of your research and your thinking. But I've, one of the things, though, we've never talked about, and I've never seen anyone even write about, mm -hmm. is that, that this went from the gray ga galleries to the green galleries to the red galleries to the blue galleries, yeah, yeah, yeah. and there was a sequence, and there was a sequence not just visually and aesthetically in terms of the objects, but emotionally yes. going through the exhibition. And how did you, again, I think we can understand how the slave shackles and the silver that you got to that point of making that decision, yes. but, but they're in a whole section yes. of other things, and yes. something went before it, something went yes. afterwards, and people were intentionally manipulated through the exhibition. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, I mean, you know, that's the, that the later part is, is deciding how it all fits together. And I'm very cognizant of the fact that, especially with this, the subjects that I was dealing with, and the fact that it's historical society and never, you know, of course never would deal with it, but, you know, it's just never been, was not really in museums at all. So. Uh, was aware that I wanted to bring people in in kind of, with a lot of you know head scratching and 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 curiosity. Uh, I don't see it there, but um, that so that but not hit them over the head with the the most um, kind of you know shocking thing. Uh, I wanted people to come in and realize that they had to do some work. I wasn't going to explain it to them. They had to look at these things and think their thoughts. Um, and then put, try to put it all together. Because what are museums but objects that, on view that you, you have to sort of understand in some, some way in, uh, according to where they are and what they're, what they're about without even reading a label. And so I was just pushing the envelope of that. And so I was very cognizant of, of the, uh, what was a little less, a little more benign. And as I pulled, uh, as I brought people to things that are a little more difficult. Um, and then I would go back to sort of something that would follow up with something that, that would make them look, once you sort of have a difficult thing, then people start looking at things a little more closely. I wasn't intuiting that. I, I wasn't thinking that, but I'm, in hindsight, the, uh, the um, uh, what was I gonna say? Oh, I can't remember now. Well, it's interesting saying that because in the, in the book that we, we did, which, we, which is dedicated to the museum visitor, mm -hmm. um, right, up, right up front, um, that one of the docents in there, and when they were interviewed, said that to, to her, and the meaning the historical society's docents, not the artist docents that we had working on the project, said it forced guides to do what I love for guides to do to get the audience involved. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I'm you know, so I also like surprise. That was another thing I was trying to remember. That I, I like the notion of surprise in a museum, in a, especially a museum where you don't expect anything surprising, and you know. Oftentimes, I find, and I think was found, that you get, a, you get surprised, and then you have to step back and say, why am I surprised? You know? And so uh, I like that, how surprise can do that, and I tried to push the envelope with that as well. Um, and you know, so some things were you know, vaguely humorous, and, and I, I bring humor into it in different, different situations because I, I just want it to be an ebb and flow and not, you know, um, you know, I want people to have a variety of experiences with it. And the other thing with having a year to work on it, um, it, it was very, it became a very complex, dense project uh, where that you could go through it, and I think people did. They go through it once, and if you go through it again, you see something entirely different. You see other things that you didn't notice before, and, and you could go several times and p see things um, um, see different aspects that you hadn't seen before. And that was also, because it was like a donut, actually. Uh, and so that was also something I was very keen on, and uh, that, you know, it's not a one-time, it doesn't have to be a one-time experience. If you go once, you get certain things. If you go twice, you get more. And then it becomes much more richer as you go 
few times. Yeah, we were very interested in capturing that visitor experience. And we, we had a survey, as you know, we had a survey for people to fill out. And uh, that started with what, what was the most powerful thing that you encountered. And, and one of the surveys, I just want to summarize what they said. And then they had to ask to identify themselves. It say, this person said, powerful, question mark. Yes, it has the ability to promote racism and hate in young blacks and was offensive to me, three exclamation points. And they identified themselves as 62 from Easton, Caucasian, retired dentist. So it's interesting in terms of these sur surveys, the range, and again, we could quote surveys that said it was the most important effective thing in their life and, and how you brought these issues finally, especially in Baltimore, to light. Um, when you say in terms of surprising people, were you like surprised at those kind of reactions? You know, I have to say, it's, uh, maybe it sounds like I'm contradicting myself. I didn't really, I wasn't thinking about the audience in that very simplistic way. I wasn't even thinking about it. When you make an artwork, you're not thinking about the audience necessarily. You're just trying to reach in as deep as you can and pull something out that is real. And people hopefully connect with that uh, uh, and make meaning from that. My, my, the difference here is that I'm in a, you know, it's not in my studio, it's not gonna be only for, you know, initially uh, art, the art cognoscenti. It's, it's gonna be for the public and, uh, and there's not gonna, not gonna be any mediating device by, made by somebody else, it's just whatever the experience they have. And so, um, um, I, I, you know. So could we talk about the, that public? A little bit, um, how the public fac factored into mining the museum. I mean, uh, we talked about the docents, we talked about artists in, in the region that served as docents, the, the video that you did with uh, Lee Boot here in Baltimore. I mean, many, many, many artists and volunteers, or over 100 <laughs> individual volunteers that, that work with you doing the, the research. Um, one of the things that resulted from that was the handout was in the elevator. Um, so could you talk about how those kinds of things um, unintentionally, um, involuntarily almost became part of what this project was for people? Um, in terms of the, the public um, participation and involvement in what you were doing? the people that I worked with. Well, basically, I, I, they didn't know it. I relied heavily on just their reactions to things. Uh, it, you know, because as I'm from New York City, I wanted to, I, you know, I wanted to sort of uh, understand a little bit more, and this is again, this is not, I wasn't saying this to myself before I went there, it's just, uh, in hindsight, this is how I work. But I wanted to, uh, to kind of get people's reactions to things, uh, understand what, the, what, what, you know, the, the nuance between here and other places, so that it, uh, I don't, um, you know, I, I, I think it's something interesting and it's not. I think it's something benign and it's not. I want to be in control of that. I'm not saying that I would, would you know, uh, dull it down because of, of people's responses, but I want to try to as much know as, I, as much as I can about reactions, general reactions to things. And so all their, their, their comments and little asides really uh, informed what I did, and sometimes, you know, it wasn't like I was writing down what everything everybody said. It's just I sort of be, became a part of the community, and and so could uh, what I what I did. The responses, the way I would do something, was became measured because I was in the community, not because I was trying to change things. And so, if I did this in New York City, it might have been entirely different. If I did it, you know, someplace else in the country or another country, it would be a very different project. So that impact, as you say, for the project on the audience, it was very clear and still is 25 years later, people, as you say, still talk about that and come to this event mm -hmm. to, to learn more about it. How would you assess the impact of mining, uh, or can you assess the impact of mining the museum on the two institutions, on the Contemporary and the Maryland Historical Society? Well, I mean, I, you tell me that one. I, 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 <laughs> I, I you know, I, I 
I mean, I know the general thing that happened with the exhibition that was just, you know, kind of none of us, I don't think, really expected it to be so popular and, and uh, uh, I think the historical society, and again, you know, uh, I was an artist coming in and going. I got to know many of them. We all we became, uh, many of us became friends, in the, in both institutions. Uh, but um, the historical society got more than they bargained for. You know, it, it was over kind of overwhelming for them. The the attention is not like attention they they never had, and. Uh, so that was a, a, a good thing, but also they couldn't stay the same. That was a real. That was the problem for them. They. they Will you feel comfortable talking about that? I do. Do you feel comfortable talking about that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the public, you know, really, this you couldn't put the genie back in the bottle after after this. And you know, the thing, the crazy thing about this was a lot of it I didn't know as until as as I was going along that on the the runaway slave broadsides. The family who who was trying to get the slave came to the opening. The family of this of the enslaved person came to the opening. I didn't, you know, I'm a New Yorker. You know, everybody's from somewhere else, you know, generally, and so these deep roots was not something I was totally aware of. And so, thank goodness, I tried to kind of be slightly immersive and try to understand a little more about how things work here because it was personal. And it's, you know, the thing about the slave experience is something that everybody in the country knows and people outside the country know a bit about it too. It's, you know, unfortunately it's, it's kind of a, uh, kind of one of our, you know, hot points of history in America. But for here, it, it really was personal and which I didn't entirely know the extent to that. So, and I think also was probably some of the, if, if the, if the uh, curators at the historical society were at all nervous, it was probably was, that was part of, part of it, which I, they didn't share with me. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think even the, uh, the, writer, uh, the writer who reviewed it from in the, Times. no, the, here, in, here in Baltimore, Baltimore, his family. Oh, John Dorsey. Yes, mm -hmm. was also, you know, That's right. they wanting family. So, so it was, it, you know, um, so it had many levels, uh, many layers, uh, uh, I don't know if this is where the question mm -hmm. had gone, but in many layers of how people received this, but it, it uh, either kind of historically from a distance or very, but very personally. Um. So people always ask me that question. That's always the question I'm always asked after giving a presentation about mine in the museum. They say, well, so what happened? Oh, yeah. What happened afterwards? What happened yeah. at, the, at, the, yeah. at the historical society? I mean, I can talk about what happened in the contemporary. We went on you know, to work with Alice and Sarr with Catfish Dreaming on the back of a 1959 pickup truck. You know, so I can talk about that, but everyone wants to know what happened to the Maryland history. What was the impact in their future? Uh, well, you know, there was there was a change in uh, some a change in board. Some board members left, some stayed. So, you know, uh, the, the director was fired was six fired. months later. Uh, but but explain it. People think that he was fired because of the show. No. <laughs> no, I, we know that. Everyone assumes that. Yeah. Tell them why he was fired. Uh, well, my, uh, maybe you don't know. Well, I my what I understood was that he was <laughs> fired because not because they were mad about the show as it was. What they know. were ma mad about was that it was so popular that it meant they had to change. Yes. And so that was real. So he was a scapegoat for that. That that uh, you know, of course, they wouldn't they wouldn't put it that way. But that is essentially That's right. what it was. And uh, so he was not mad at me or George or anything. He was actually mad at his colleagues in other museums because they didn't come to, to support him uh, in, in this situation. Uh, but um, no, it was, uh, the, the newspaper was saying, what are you gonna do next? You know, public. And the American Associates Museums Conference was here, yes. 4,000 professionals came to yes. see the show yes. during the in conference. In three days. And they went back all across the country with the news. And, uh, <laughs> 
and the two page spread in the New York spread Times. You know, so it was they had to change, and it was and this is of course the director. This is the reason he wanted to do something. He didn't really his know what, what, yeah. his, what it, you know to his credit, uh, because it was the you know really having hard times financially. Yes, and the trustees were. It was a, you know it was a place where where uh, people would be on the board and because they're of their place in society and and this was a nice place to be you know and and just to continue uh, it wasn't like it was a art and history museum but but not like it was a historical society which is a different animal or used to be right and so yeah well, it's interesting when uh, after mining museum was over of course they wanted the contemporary to continue working with them, right? Because, because again, the question that was posed by the board to the director was, "What's next? You know, what, what, what do we do?" Mm -hmm. And so they met with a contemporary, and they said, "Well, could you continue working?" I said, "No, we're we're on the pickup truck with Allison right, right now. Right, right, right. Like we're not, you know, interested." But they asked us our advice, like, "Well, what do you think we should do?" Interesting. And I said, "Well, it's very simple. It's like three words: artist, artist." artist, like an artist yeah. made, made this possible, looked at your collection, work with your curators and your staff, and bring the artist in. You know, there's a little display, I just went today by the historical, so I haven't been there in years, and it looks, it's totally different, but there, there's a display of an artist's work, and they, they, and they, they say in the text, you know, he's a painter, and they're looking at the collections and doing his paintings, and it says, we invited him to mine, in quotations, our collection. <laughs> it's like, oh, really? <laughs> um, but, but, and this is, you know, 25 years later, nobody there now, and this is about museums, too. Uh, museums change glacially, uh, and in many cases, their staff changes. You know, nobody stays any, in a, any one place uh, these days for any length of time. I mean, it happens in Europe because they're state museums and, and so, uh, government museums, so they're, they're you know, like uh, professional, you know, they're, they're civil, and civil servants. But here in the United States, people move from place to place. And so there's nobody there now that was there when I was there. And, uh, of course, some of them are no longer anywhere. But anyway, um, uh, but so it's a really, so they've got this legacy that they don't really know themselves. And, and they've got their, and of course they, they are a historical site. They have other reasons for being than just, you know, answering questions about mining the museum. So, um, anyway. It was interesting in terms of impact in terms of the historical site, because I was down there uh, yesterday, uh, intentionally also, and I mean, I go, every few years to see what's going on. Um, what's interesting is that the portrait of Henry Darnell III, which we see up, you've seen up Around here, soon. Um, with, the slave, with the slave boy holding uh, the, the dead bird and, and with his bow and arrow and all that, right? Uh, which was a major part of the exhibition that Fred put, and it is, is the most important painting in their whole collection. Um, it's on the it was on the cover of their, the board, their annual report that year the year before mining the museum, um, that the, the, in the um, survey we did with the children that came, because we had 3,000 Baltimore City school children come through also on tours, um, that one, this is what one of the um, docents said about one of the fourth graders that came on the school tour. The fourth grader said, why does he have the silver band around his neck? The docent said, because that's, the docent said, because that's the way they used to say it, that's his little friend. I mean, the, fourth grader, the fourth grader said, you don't put a collar around your friend's neck. Is this uh, re re Yeah. Yeah, this is part of a transcript from, from a tour. So it's interesting, like 25 years later, wow. the, the, the um, object label for that painting yeah. has changed, right? Like because back then it was strictly about the Darnell family, their plantation, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the German artist um, Justice Engelhard Kuhn. It was all about, the label was about that, right? The history of the Darnell plantation, all that. 
Now the label reads differently. The, la the label says Henry Darnell III, and has, of course, the date and all, the artist. Justice Engelhard Kuhn, a German Protestant and the first recorded professional portrait painter in Maryland, depicted Darnell with his slave. This may be the earliest known portrait of an American slave that survives. Oh, well, I mean, initially, you know, and obviously when I, when they were there, there was no even a mention of, the, of this uh, slave on the exactly. picture. That's the change. And, yes. uh, and uh, when, I, when we moved, this, moved it, we realized there was a metal collar around the child's neck. And, and the director said, you know, I never noticed that black child in the painting. You know, and really, you know, that museum, you were not, well, it was, we walked by it every day. And that's a little bit of a stretch not to see them there. But, but really, you were not meant to see the black population. You were not meant to see immigrants. You're not meant to, to see, you know, to see uh, other, uh, other ethnic groups. Oh, yeah, there it is. Uh, and museums are really good at making you not see things and not think things. But you really made us see, I want to talk especially for people that weren't there, because what happened, again, we were talking to, earlier today about the limited technology we had available to us 25 years ago, that when you walked up to this painting, it triggered a motion detector that bought on a spotlight, a hal ha halogen spot uh, bulbs had just come out, so it was a white, pure light. And so it came on, and, and the, the, the rest of the painting stayed, stayed lit. But the slave boy's head was spotlit by this halogen light. That was the first thing it triggered. And then the second thing it triggered was a, a recording behind the painting. You might, might want to talk about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I wanted people to see them, but I didn't want, I mean, I didn't want to be heavy handed about it. I didn't want to write it on the label because that's not what they did. I wanted them to see it in another modality. So I asked the children, what do they thought of the children? There are other, there were a whole bunch of paintings like, uh, like this that I, that I pulled from the, from the spaces. And I asked the, the children that I had, a group of black children, what they thought of the paintings, what they thought of, and they, they, they had all these responses. And from that I called, uh, the words that the voice that you heard the child's voice speaking, which was with that particular painting was, um, no, am I your friend? Am I your friend? Am I your, am I your brother? Am I, am I your, your pet? pet? And uh, you know he clearly could have been all three. So the so so these voices came off the paintings, but also, and so all of them had that in this one room. Um, but I wanted to say. I think that they could do a little better than, than say, and his slave. I, do you think? I mean, in 2017. <laughs> um, uh, one of the other paintings that I had, I, uh, because I have a huge library, I researched the two black children in the painting because they weren't mentioned anywhere. And, uh, and we found a letter saying their names because they were, you know, they were being the, the owner of the, of the, the, who did the portrait and also the owner of the, these two children wanted to send them to school. And the From school, the slave records. That's right. Mm -hmm. And the school didn't want, did not want them to, be, to go to the school, so they had their names. Uh, this painting has, don't have the, does not have the names of these children. And you know, to say that is someone is their slave, uh, that puts it in a very contemporary. To me, it sort of jumps to the contemporary. Rather than saying enslaved child, uh, it, 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 so but that's, you know, at least they have the word slave there, I guess. But after 25 years, I just think they could do a little better with that. It's probably an old label. Um, the last question I want to ask you before we may open up to, to questions is how we talked, the first question about your previous um, art, artistic practice and oh. what you were doing, but how has your practice or your artwork developed in the last 25 years as a result of mining? Well, I think I, I said, I, I, uh, while I probably would have continued sort of uh, kind of intellectually unpacking museums, uh, because of mining the museum, I, I, I see the, the importance and resonance of uh, uh, meeting with as many people as possible, trying to, wherever I am and trying to, knowing that I'm not going to really get it, I'm not from a particular place, and if I'm doing something in some other country, I really don't, I'm not necessarily going to get it. But I can uh, mitigate 
some real huge faux pas by being in a place a long period of time and just understanding a little more about how th how things are, um, you know, how things work in that place. And it's the kind of the important thing for me, a real important benchmark for me to be able to do that. Otherwise, uh, the project would not be successful because they would not be, you know, it would not be for the for that community wherever it is. Right. But, it, but, but be, and it, is there anything besides what you're describing, what you got from working in that new way, that unique way for you back then 25 years ago with us? Is there anything in terms of 25 years that in terms of the identity of your work, the content, the subject matter no, that the subject developed? Matter, the subject matter, you know, I that was uh, very specific uh, and it was uh, kind of important, but you know, not all museums, like in Poland, there's no, you know, black slaves in, in Poland, it's last time I checked. But if, you know, it's about that particular place. And so the research really digs into wherever I am. Um, and, and, and what bubbles up are, mostly I'm, I'm a curator of denial. You know, cure, you know and, and uh, where there's something that nobody's talking about and it's staring at me in the face and I wonder why. And so I follow that those roots, and I I usually find out, and I you know the good thing is find out before the exhibition happens, not after it's up, and everybody's like wah. Um, but uh, so it it's to me I just follow follow my questions and make an exhibition about that. So could you maybe give an example either whether it's the Istanbul Biennial that you're working on right now or um, the most recent shows you've done. That, that you could give an example of that, what you discovered and how that led you? Uh, oh, well, you know, a, a lot of the projects that I do that are really successful in the United States seems to, to be around African-American history of one sort or another. Um, but there are um, certain things, well, I'm not even gonna talk about the one in, 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 at Oberlin, right. which was about Ammonia Lewis, this 19th century sculptor, black native sculptor. Uh, uh, with that, because that's a, has a different complexity to it. But I just, j just to mention uh, the project I did in Savannah, um, uh, I was sort of one of the things that happened with that project. And I'll just mention one thing: is that uh, the new museum, the SCAD Museum of Art, uh, it was built in an old railroad station, and um, as I and you know it's, it's it looks historic like everything else. And as I walked in, the curator said, "Oh well, this is an old railroad brick railroad station, and all, and all the, the building is slave made bricks." So uh, just little things like that kind of kind of get me thinking. And this and this so the whole project uh, and these collections were kind of flipping around uh, the notion of bricks and and their place and how they're used. And how they're not used, and how uh, in the, in that city, and just in general. Um, so artworks were kind of, you know, bricks are used in revolts. Bricks are used to make boundaries. Bricks, you know, have these different um, lay, represent labor. So the, everything had there was lots of brick in the space, sort of in these in these forms. And uh, some of the actual slave-made bricks, which I which I used, were put in these. I, I created these boxes. Uh, uh, by the not by famous African American uh, uh, writers, because the collection that I that I was working with also had a whole uh, document, all these documents of famous people who wrote. And so, instead of the the documents in in these leather bound books, uh, were these were one slave made brick. And so the weight of history was in these kind of basically in these in these uh, boxes. Um, and if I touch on the African American story here, it becomes very cogent. In other places, as I said, it's not there; it's something else. In Australia, it's about you know Aboriginal concerns, and and I'm always revealing things once I start with it. Before we open up to a few questions, uh, do you have anything that you had hoped we would touch on and talk about in our conversation that we haven't? Well, I guess I I, I am really curious about because I was sort of outside, they made it much, very easy for me to do what I do because they 
held the hands, you know, he held the director's hand through this process of, of this person who's just coming in looking around at things. And uh, Lisa Kerr and the curator held the hand of the, uh, I, I sort of I didn't see the actual holding hands, but I mean, held the hands of the, of the chief curator there as we went through this process, which is very nonlinear. Uh, it's not like normal scholarship where you're, you come in with an idea and you sort of research. If this was just a meandering process, which is what my, what my process is. Uh, but just those kind of, now I'm hearing about the, the, uh, the contract, but was it, obviously I was pulling things out mm -hmm. and they were, you know, they must have had comments, but they never, you know, museums are very nice and certainly here they were very nice. So I never really got a full sense of if there certain things were really problematic or, um, you know, that they had to grapple with that they weren't telling me. I always assumed that they, they pulled out these scary things because somebody else's head would be on the chopping block and, they, and uh, not theirs, I don't know. Well, it's interesting, you, you saw for the, Fred saw for the first time that picture I have of Fred oh. in, in the board, the uh, president of the Board of Trustees office and that's what we jokingly called his studio. Uh, so, so there he was with his files, research files, and photos, and and uh, color Pantone charts, and <laughs> all, all kinds of kinds of things, right? Uh, thinking, conceiving of what he was doing, right? And so we would we would be, get asked on a daily basis, based whenever you were there working in your quote unquote studio, that uh, what were you making? Right, so, so sort of our role was not just, um, I guess, opening doors for you and keeping, trying to keep them open for you, but it was, and protect the creative freedoms that you had, but trying to really explain to them how contemporary, like you started with, how contemporary artists work, what their process is, um, what their needs are, um, what, the risk, what the risks are, but what the risks are that will you know, nine, ninety-five percent will come out great. Um, so we were able to talk about that with them a lot, to give them assurances about that. And they also knew because of that contract, mm -hmm. they did know that as a scholarly institution, that they were not going to be embarrassed. That, you know, so that protected them, right? So we were trying to protect you creatively, and we were trying to also protect them in terms of as a history museum and their scholarship. So, so that they didn't come yelling and screaming, pulling at their hair with anything N I, you know. No, the only times they came um, with problems that we had to sort of, fires to put out and before talking to you, uh, was the clan, when, when you found the clan hood, the Ku Klux Klan hood mm -hmm. uh, in the textile collection. That's right. Anonymously donated. Anonymously donated, 1970, found in an attic in Towson, Maryland. Um, that, that was an issue, talking about that, and especially, really? yeah. well, because not the, not the hood per se, but you putting it in the baby carriage, right? right? So it's in their collection, displaying it is one issue. They were fine with that, it's in their collection. But you then taking the liberty mm -hmm. of putting that juxtaposition in, unlike the slave shackles, which were not in the coffee pot. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I see. They were there, right? Hmm. Were the whipping posts and the chairs in front of it. Then you had um, an intervention yes. between yes. those yes. two. So that was, that was the issue. And it's interesting, it wasn't as much an issue in terms of the concept of it. It was about the security of it. Right, I remember that. In fact, they put a little Beeping light. Yeah, that was our really solution. Was not at all. They wanted to put it in a big vitrine. Their solution was to put all that baby, all that in a vitrine, because they were afraid that either someone from the clan, mm -hmm. or any, or, or someone, know, yeah. right, someone would uh, destroy it, take it, or whatever. Right. And so they, that was the issue, the, the security of that, right. of that. Mm -hmm. So the, as you say, the solution was then us to put an alarm system under the hood that if someone did reach in there, the, the motion detector would set off the alarms for the guards. Right, but in fact... Never happened. Well, in fact, the, that thing, that, you know, which uh, blinked mm. was not connected to anything. It, it was red. It looked like a, uh, it was something. Now we can say So they eventually they threw it, they sort of jettisoned it because it wasn't, yep. you know, really not doing it. I didn't like it aesthetically, it messed up the whole thing. But, uh, but really, not, you know, 
There you go. So well, yeah, that was that's pretty that, good. If that's that the was only thing that they well, were. the only other thing was when uh, at the eleventh hour you were talking about putting things from McDonald's into the exhibition. Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, bad that's idea. a whole other show. Bad idea. Yeah. Uh, so um, we're, we have a time for a few questions, and if Fred will be here afterwards, and and the contemporary sewing the the catalogs out front that Fred has already signed. But and and Dina has a mic if you need it. She's way back there. Got her, already got her question. Wait, 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 wait. wait for the mic. Hi, um, I was wondering. Um, how your work as a museum educator and as a curator and as an artist individually, how that like, what you've learned as your like roles in each one, how like what you've learned has overlapped and like what skills you've learned and like how has one informed the other? Um, well, I think as far as educator, I mean it's also, oh, hello. It's also part of my personality, but as an educator, to kind of really let things sink in. I, I, when, I ha when I have students, I don't assume that I understand what they're doing necessarily, uh, even if they don't really understand what they're doing. Uh, I, I sort of trust that somewhere in there, there's, some, there's, a, there's a real kind of guide, and I, I get to know them to sort of see if they're, if they're in line with what they're doing. Uh, but assume that I don't know what they'll do after, after, after what they're making, and because I don't know them, and so I assume that they're going to do something interesting. It's just they've got to get to that thing, and if I feel like they're moving away one way or another way, um, you know, we worked to get to what's real, and this is this is kind of basically the same as what I'm doing when I'm working with museums. Um, and um, Brad, can you talk into your mic? There we go. Okay. Oh, sorry about that. Um, yeah. So that's kind of uh, that. That's. It, I don't know if you know if that's learned from 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 you know mining the museum or if it's just the development of my own way of teaching or and. But it's all it all has to do with my personality. And you really have to find out who you are and just go with that, whether good, bad, or indifferent, because it's who you are. And that and and then it's a real. It's real, and so for me, it's doing all that I do is very much in line with who I am. We have one back here, and we can take two more. Wait, we have one back here first. Oh, first, one second. Yeah. I hold on, hold on. You got to get that. I have it, but it's not working. Okay, there we go. There you go. Um, could you both speak to the change or lack? Change or lack thereof. Okay. Um, in cultural institutions in our current moment, particularly in relation to the shift in the field and AAM's focus on diversity and inclusion this year, um, are there things that you think have changed positively or negatively in cultural institutions in the last 25 years? Well, I'm going to start first in terms of, uh, in terms of here, obviously, right? And again, I started by giving the backstory, saying what was happening in the field, uh, not just in Baltimore, but ev everywhere in terms of the museum field, and how the, fortunately that is not what it looks like today, right? So you know, we can look at the BMA, we can look at the Walters, we, you know, we can look at museums here and what they've been doing, you know, and how they have changed, how they have brought artists in, how their education departments are collaborating with their curators, right? All these very important things to really make a whole, more holistic approach to what they're doing in the museums. So, you know, a lot of that obviously has to do with the leadership of the institutions um, and their visions um, for what goes on there. So, um, but I would say in terms of both locally and in the field, things have changed drastically. I mean, you look back at the AAM, so in 1992, their first time in Baltimore ever, right? Eight years later, they were here when the BMA, under Doreen's leadership, did the Joyce Scott kicking it with the old masters with Micah's exhibition development seminar. Right? Then, five years ago, they're back in Baltimore you know, for their conference. And if you follow each of those times and you look at the kind of sessions, like you're saying, and what the themes are, they change drastically. 
right? They, they really go from sort of governance and scholarship to things, as you say, in terms of issues today and engagement. Um, so it's a huge shift uh, in the field. You, yeah, you, it may be hard to see, but it really is a huge shift. I always say uh, my reception of museums has really changed, not only because I've sort of done a lot now, and so you know, everybody thinks they're going to get 50,000 people coming to their exhibitions, I don't know. But also there's so many more, now there's many more women directors, and uh, the conversation has shifted because of that. You know, uh, and also um, they've made, I mean, compared to, you know, everything's in comparison to what it used to be. Uh, the, they've diversified um, staffing. They, uh, they, it's a kind of uh, constant process, but it's it, the, the desire, and they're actually uh, sort of keeping their own feet to the fire for diversifying their staff. And, not all boards, but yeah, I'm, I'm a New Yorker, and so I do uh, know that um, they're diversifying the boards, too. Because the, what happens is the boards, uh, if the board doesn't shift, the conversation only goes so far, so far. It's very, it's, it's, and so no matter what. On the board of the Whitney. Yes, I'm on the board of the Whitney. Um, and other institutions, and so, the, you need people on the board, the, the, the director could be whoever, uh, but if the board can, can, can even grapple with the concept of diversity, which certainly was what it was like years ago, uh, you, you really, are, it's a non-starter. And so now it's, it's um, you know, you can, one would not say that every board member is of the same, you know, uh, interests, persuasions, uh, you know, Everybody thinks alike. However, the conversation is a much different one, and the assumption that that the diversity is important uh, is there, um, and and so they're they're all moving towards that within their boards, and that again has already shifted the conversation within the boards. Um, you know, there's a there's a lot. Of, you know, as I always say, these large museums move like you know, like uh, ocean liners, just kind of slowly making that turn but it's it's uh, it is much more different much different than it was i mean obviously a lot can more needs to happen i mean it's just clear but um more has happened the curatorial practice mfa at yes Jamaica. yes these kind of changes these kind of conversations are are definitely uh making making the the uh the internal mechanisms at the museums more like what's going on outside the museums. And I, I, I said this earlier today that um, because of the, the, um, the new realities that we have here in the United States uh, for the arts, all of a sudden, you know, it's been 25 years, but all of a sudden museums are doing exhibitions that they would have never done before. Uh, Pop-up exhibitions, you know, uh, exhibitions about uh, immigrants and or or just you know the last minute things which is really uh, amazing deciding that we're going to do something different and um, so of course when it's their pocketbooks you know then it's perhaps it becomes more more uh, kind of uh, urgent but they have been he hearing all these things all these years and now they're they're putting into practice if it is even self-serving uh, so I, I just think that it's important that I have the, that you and I have this long perspective, but um, I can certainly understand that if you don't think you you and this is the reality is this now you want to see a much more major change, and I'm and I'm with you on that. One down here. Hi, Fred. Hi there. How are you? <laughs> uh, speaking of glacial museums, member. <laughs> When I was at the Metropolitan Museum, we brought you in and tried to do a project. Yeah. And one of the things that surprised me, and I wondered if it came up in other projects that you did with other staffs, was that the curators, it wasn't the problem with you doing the project, but the fact that your voice would have been privileged over theirs. Oh, I never heard about that. You were there. You remember. Well, you know, I... You know, I I, 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 you know, I didn't actually hear. I mean, did, uh, did you have, I mean, when you were working with staffs, 
did you ever, you know, because it's like a curator, particularly in a big museum, you have your own. Oh yes, well, see, this is this so is very interesting. You can't cross over. Yes, yes, this is very okay. interesting. So and they were the artist agents. They were nervous that you would have more agency than they would. Yes, and I understand that. And the, but you see, they're all. For various reasons, people get nervous when I'm when I'm first there. We never got to the point where we were dealing with each other as people, and they understand who I am, and you know, and that it you know is not who I am to, to sort of do that. They they would they would see their scholarship in what I do, except it would be it would be a different something slightly different, um, and so that's why I don't really do a project unless the director is, or the chief curator is the one inviting me. They have to, they have to really commit themselves to, to this so that when things like that, that come up in whatever level, there, there can be a dialogue within them because it's, you know, it's not one of them bringing me into one. I've had the situations where I brought in by a curator of one, one particular area and wanting to borrow things from other areas and, and you know, it, it, there's, there's become conflicts, and then in, in that situation, the the director had to come in to sort of, you know, deal with it, uh, but um, because it was, you know, that that became tricky. Um, so I only now I only do something in a museum like that if, if the the top level is really can say this is what he's doing, and we've all bought into it, and and then you know then I and then it's up to me to make it. Uh, to sort of them to really understand me and and we work it out. It's it's uh, you know it it's you know I haven't had any problems along those lines once we get past that first the first uh, encounters. Um, it's interesting. I did not know that. I what I knew was that um, the funding kind of wasn't there, and had I known had I known the funding wasn't there. I would have said, well, I don't care about the funding, you know, I want to do this project. But, but I think there was just, you know, that was, uh, maybe there's more than one thing that was, that was the, the issue. Uh, I did a project with MoMA, it was, uh, I did a project with MoMA years ago. She, the question was, have I done anything else in New York, uh, at any of the New York museums? No, most of the, for the longest time, most of them, you know, they're, the, the, the difficult thing for New York is that they feel everybody looks at New York, so they can't make a misstep. And so bringing me in is a risk of, of a misstep that, that would, rever for them, reverberate larger than it really would. But anyway, so, um, with, but with MoMA, I was invited because of um, Kiniston uh, to do, he was, had an exhibition called, um, um, Museum as Muse, and it had many artists who would deal with museum things, and I came in to do a project. And uh, again, this is with this particular curator, who I, you know, we got along really well. Uh, I was looking at, you know, I wanted to look at the artworks, and they were, the majority of works are off-site somewhere, uh, and because I deal with objects. So, um, and it was, would have been difficult to sort of see all the things I wanted to see. They couldn't be brought, because it's really expensive insurance-wise to bring it bring it to the museum. So there's all these hierarchies that were, were difficult. And so they gave me, they had images at that time, they had books, photo books, of all the objects in the collection. And so I'm going through the books, I'm looking, I'm pulling out, pulling out uh, pictures that I, of objects and uh, such. And, and I brought them to Kiniston and um, I showed him, this is, this is what I wanted to use. He says, oh, very interesting, very interesting. Yeah, and I said, I particularly like this Brancusi. He said, Oh, you want the real Boncuzzi? <laughs> you just laughed. You just laughed. <laughs> so it was clear that it was that was not going to happen in that way. There. Uh, you know, I wasn't the only artist. It was a group, and so I don't know what the budget was to because bringing things out of storage and just or whatever whatever the hierarchy. What I'm just not. I didn't even you know try to un unpack that too much. So I ended up making an exhibition with photographs of things, and as well as photographs of the parties they had and all this other thing. Anyway, they own, they own, they own this piece. Probably will keep it in the basement. <laughs> no, they own it, they put it out. <laughs> Try to find your, locate your brand to work with. Yeah, right, all right, all right. So I, I just want to, first off,
acknowledge and thank uh, Micah, all the academic administrative departments that made this possible, um, and them understanding the impact of your work and the project on me, um, this being my final public program before retirement, that they acknowledge that. So, um, So it's an <laughs> Okay. Stay standing for, for our guest of honor, Fred. Stay standing for Fred. Thank you all. Thank you. I'm here. If you have any other questions, I'm here. So I, yeah, you know, I can't believe I nobody asked him about that video from earlier, or or the Jay Z music video. Oh that's yeah, wrong. that yeah 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 me and Jay Z yeah. That's a, that's a story. That's a story.